Please be seated and come to order. <laughs> um, what we're going to do now is, is pick up some of the same um, themes we discussed in the previous session, except now we're going to do it through the um, eyes of two very uh, distinguished and experienced federal judges. And I'll introduce them briefly. Um, to my right is uh, Chief Judge Diane Wood of the Seventh Circuit. Uh, they sit in Chicago. Uh, she's, uh, in addition to her uh, day job as a judge, she's been a law professor at the University of Chicago for many years and is uh, one, one of the best known um, scholars of uh, constitutional law in addition to her, her distinguished service on the Tenth Circuit. Seventh. Seventh. Sorry about that. <laughs> I like the Tenth Circuit. I like the Tenth Circuit, too. In fact, we have Tenth Circuit judges here, but Chicago has been in the Seventh Circuit for a long time. So, and, uh, and to my uh, left is uh, Kent Jordan, who sits on the Third Circuit, uh, whose uh, home is here in Philadelphia. He's actually from uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, uh, I asked uh, Judge Jordan to join us in particular because he is uh, the author of the uh, dissenting opinion in the Third Circuit's decision in the Conestoga Wood Products case, which we talked about earlier. And so he, he, his view was ultimately the one that the uh, majority of the Supreme Court adopted in that case. And so we should have an interesting conversation about a number of the issues that, um, that we've been talking about. But let me just start out by asking um, both of our judges, uh, what, is, what do you take, uh, or how do you see Madison's significance in, in, the, in the pantheon of founders? It's hard to um, underestimate uh, Madison's, uh, or sorry, it's hard to overestimate Madison's significance because I think it's now well established in our jurisprudence that we begin our analysis by looking at what the Constitution says and looking in particular for today's program at what the Bill of Rights says. He wrote these things, but I also uh, would pick up on one of the themes that our uh, previous panel was talking about, Madison was a pragmatist. He changed his mind over the years. He thought more deeply as experience shed light on what these words might mean and what they could mean. And so I, I take a lot of insight from the course of his thinking as well as the particular words he put on the page about various provisions, whether it was freedom of religion provisions, whether it was freedom of speech, whether it was questions about the relation between the national government and the states. And remember, he begins all of this as a young man at Princeton before the Revolutionary War, convinced, number one, that the colonies should work together, number two, that there should be a strong national presence, and then during the Articles of Confederation period, He's just distraught at the dysfunctionality of the government. So his bottom line is that the national government is very important. And then there are refinements to how that national government ought to work that he works on literally for the rest of his life. So he's, he's got a set of principles, but his sense of how to implement those principles evolves over time based on, on experience. Based on experience and based on, I think, an incredible ability to learn from others, whether it's from reading things or whether it's from the, the many distinguished people with whom he worked. Mm -hmm. Judge Jordan, what, what is, how do, when you think of Madison, what, what, what do you think of? I think it's, uh, uh, if you were looking for evidence, uh, Maybe I'm going too fast to the religion cases. <laughs> you, we'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to look for uh, the hand of divinity, you can you can readily uh, find evidence of it in the appearance of James Madison on the scene because he's just an extraordinary character and the right person for the right moment in history. He has this rem <laughs> remarkable blend of uh, capacity to think deeply and a desire to think deeply about uh, political structure. He, he's thinking about the flaws in the national government long before uh, the Constitutional Convention in 1787. He gets a trunk full of books from Jefferson uh, and, and reads them and digests them and thinks about and ponders on these things. And the investment of his uh, remarkable intellect absorbing all this information that Professor Newborn was talking about, 
uh, ends up getting blended with practical experience. So he's both a deep thinking theorist and an extraordinarily precocious and skilled practitioner of practical politics. And I think that's a very rare combination, somebody who's really very deeply thoughtful and also committed to getting things done. So I think uh, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd disagree a little bit with uh, Mr. Stewart to the extent he was saying maybe he's, uh, Madison shouldn't have the title of uh, father of the Constitution. I think he is the preeminent guy. And he was recognized as the preeminent guy uh, during the course of the convention. Uh, he is just a remarkable figure. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't a lawyer. Um, he, All to his credit, right? And he wasn't, <laughs> uh, certainly wasn't a judge. Um, and yet, you know, here we are, we're, we're, we're judges trying to look at what he did. Um, is, is there anything in, in his, the way he went about what he did and the way he constructed, and you, you've just actually both spoken about this blend of pragmatism and, 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 and intellect uh, that informs what we do as judges? Anything we can take from that? Well, I hope we can take a couple things from it. One is that uh, he was not impervious to uh, evidence. <laughs> as, as things happened, he was prepared to reassess. And, and he did. And it's hard to know how much, uh, you know, you can't put him too much on a pedestal because some of the changes he made were changes that might have been driven by uh, kind of blinkered thinking. He had such a negative view of Alexander Hamilton that no matter what Hamilton did, he was sure it was evilly motivated. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he was a partisan, and he was a pretty harsh partisan in some ways. Uh, but on the whole, he was a remarkable human being because he was prepared to think and listen to the other side and to try to uh, understand both sides or multiple sides of a problem before settling on an issue, uh, a, a resolution to an issue, and being willing to reassess as evidence came along to make him rethink, you know, the states are the problem. We've got to have a stronger national government. The states are dysfunctional. And then later on saying, wait a second, too much power in the central yeah. government. We've got to get some more power out there to the states. He's willing to rethink and try to readjust. Yeah, it's interesting to read the, 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 the article he wrote on the vices of government in, what, 1787, right. saying how bad the, uh, the Articles of Confederation were. Right. And then uh, uh, about a decade later, when he's criticizing the Alien and Sedition Acts, is the central government's yeah. way too powerful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Diane, what did you think Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's illuminating, for me at least, to look at how all of these things evolve. Because Madison shows up at the Constitutional Convention with an outline of what he thinks the Constitution ought to look like. And there are quite a few parts of his outline that are very important that did not come to pass. So he certainly did not uh, favor for a very long time uh, the New Jersey plan under which the Senate had representation by states and it was only the House that had proportional representation. His original plan is that both, there should be two houses, it should be bicameral, but you shouldn't have the states so powerful. This flowed from uh, his concern about whether the, the failure of the states during the Confederation period to live up to what he thought they should be doing. So there's that. He shows up at the Constitutional Convention thinking that there should be some sort of council of revision uh, to overlook the constitutionality and probably even the wisdom of the various laws that the national legislature passes. He has a concept of a supremacy clause. It's not quite phrased that way. But as some of the structural protections that he thinks should be in the Constitution fall away during the course of the convention, he rethinks a little bit, you know, how is this actually going to work? And at the end of the convention, he, like the others, is satisfied, this is the best we're going to get. I don't think he thought it was a perfect document by any means. But he thinks it's the best that they're going to get. And so with Hamilton, and of course a very small amount with Jay, he writes the Federalist Papers. He fights like a dog to get it uh, ratified. He opposes 
ratification proposals that would say, let's have a second convention first and then have a better document, he, he, he realizes, look, this is it. Uh, and that's where the promises for the Bill of Rights come in, which he dutifully and faithfully carries out mm -hmm. the minute. But I, but I think where he comes out on the importance of the enumerated powers over the course of first the Washington administration and then the Adams administration, where he comes out on a lot of these things is a function of how the actual instrument wound up, which wasn't quite where he wanted mm -hmm. it to be, but he tries to make the what we got work. Well, we're going to get to some specifics in a second, but this, actually what you were just talking about, picks up one of the questions from the first session we didn't get to. So what, what got left on the cutting room floor? We heard about the, the council revision. We heard about a conscience clause. Is there, was there anything else that strikes you as being uh, something that was important to Madison that didn't get into the Constitution? Well, I think those, for me anyway, are the two big things. The idea of enumerating powers in Article I, Section 8, and, and wherever else, uh, I think, also was not something that he would have done to start with. Uh, there are provisions in the original draft about the scope of the judiciary's powers that look a lot different from what we're all familiar with in Article Three these days. So th those are not unimportant mm -hmm. changes, mm -hmm. but, I, but I think the, the big ticket items are the ones I mentioned. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we just jump right in here. Um, the um, first, and actually the topic that ended up taking uh, most of our time during the first session was, was freedom of religion. And I think uh, the point of consensus was that that probably was the most important of, of all of the rights to Madison. It was the one that really made his, his reputation. So um, let me just come at it this way. Uh, Judge Jordan, as you listen to the discussion, what, what were you thinking? What, what, what reaction do you have to it? Well, uh, I was thinking uh, that, that James Madison uh, is a little bit like the Bible. Everybody can read him and, and see what they want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> It's remarkable to hear uh, uh, very knowledgeable, thoughtful people like the gentleman you had on the panel saying things that I just completely disagree with. You know, when they say Madison would have been troubled by the Hobby Lobby decision, on the contrary, I think Madison would have been delighted by the Hobby mm -hmm. Lobby decision. Mm -hmm. I think he would have said uh, exactly what Professor Newborn at first said, which is there are very few things you can do that are as bad as getting somebody to violate a fundamentally held belief. Mm -hmm. that is a, that's a deeply wrong thing and something to be guarded against and that it should take something extraordinary for the government to be able to take those steps. You know, Hobby Lobby was not a constitutional case. It was a it was statutory interpretation of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And, uh, and RIFRA was an attempt to restore something that many people in America, me included, uh, think was a, a, a bad constitutional decision in Oregon versus uh, Department of uh, unemployment versus Smith. The Smith case uh, took away what had been for a very long time the strict scrutiny to be applied to uh, uh, government actions that impinge in a substantial way on religious uh, behavior and belief. And, uh, and thinking as I do that that's sound thinking, I, I happen to think that James Madison thought that same way about it, that the remonstrance was designed to put across the notion that government should be treading very, very lightly when it comes into contact with uh, deeply held fundamental beliefs. And if you look at the way the majority handled uh, the Hobby Lobby Conestoga Wood uh, decision in the Supreme Court, they put the government to the test. Somebody. I think it was Professor Newborn said something like, uh, uh, a person should have to explain why the government doesn't do that. That gets the burden of proof exactly wrong. When the government is intruding, it's on the government to show that uh, this is uh, the least restrictive way that we can handle our impinging on your, on your right. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach that the that the majority took, and I think it was right to take that approach. And 
given that there were literally tens of millions, maybe as much as 190 million people not covered by exceptions that the government itself had made to the application of the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act, you were pretty hard pressed to say, I think, with much of a straight face, well, this is such a compelling government interest that we can't make an exception for you, the Hahn family, four people in your close corporation, but for your deeply held beliefs. So it sounds like, even though you're disagreeing with the end result um, that, that our two prior panelists appeared to support, that the, maybe one point of common ground is the idea that there needs to be a balancing between. Oh. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. In yeah. a pluralistic society, yeah. it would be impossible. I mean, that was Madison's yeah. genius. He saw, yeah. we're all in here together, and yeah. guess what? Uh, he, was, he was deeply bothered by the notion that the Anglican Church uh, was going to be, you know, the way you thought. Mm -hmm. That was wrong. He admired his Presbyterian teachers at the College of New Jersey. He admired the Baptist ministers he knew in Virginia. He was prepared to accept that maybe people didn't think much about God at all. He was a big reader of deist tracts and things that kind of went off the beaten path. Uh, I don't think for a moment that he, or it's hard for me to think of any one of the founders who was going to be a big proponent of, you know, this is the way you have to mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. the deep questions of life. So yeah, there's got to be in a pluralistic society balancing and a recognition of the need for balance. And some governmental interests, if I'm hearing you right, are compelling enough that... Well, they are. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, Professor Newborn made reference to United States versus Lee, uh, not by name, but he said, uh, he, he talked about the case in which uh, an Amish uh, business owner was required to pay Social Security taxes. That case was interesting to me, uh, not for the reason he stated, because he said the Supreme Court rejected it out of hand. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. What the Supreme Court said was, we accept that this is a substantial encroachment on your religious liberty. Mm -hmm. Now the question we have to ask is, is there some less restrictive means to meet what we believe is a compelling state interest? They said it's a substantial encroachment. They, they addressed the question of whether there was a compelling government interest that justified the encroachment, and they asked the question about least restrictive means. They went through that process. They did not say, what crazy, silly Amish people don't pay Social Security. They were very thoughtful in the way they approached it, and that's what, that's what the courts ought to be doing. And they concluded that the interest was compelling. They, and, and indeed, there it was, was no compelling, and there wasn't, given the nature of the, the tax structure that, and the purpose to be accomplished, you couldn't have individual exceptions for it. But it, was not a, it wasn't a, a sort of, you know, yeah, silly rabbi. It wasn't that. It was, it was And then, of course, of Congress paper. passed a statute that uh, exempted uh, the Amish communities from Social Security. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I learned that when I was in Lancaster County this year <laughs> in your, at your circuit conference. So, um, Judge Wood, what do you think? Well, it won't surprise everyone in this room uh, that I don't see Hobby Lobby quite the same way as, as Judge Jordan. Um, but I'd like to preface my remarks about the case, and this actually also applies to our um, decisions about campaign contributions, by following up just a little bit on the, the general law of corporations, which is something I originally had occasion to get into in my capacity as an antitrust lawyer. Um, so corporations, as we've heard, do begin as monopolies conferred by, quote, the state. It would be the queen or the king uh, in the early times in, in England. And they're for very particular purposes. They're generally monopolies. There's a thing called the statute of monopolies that governs how these things are, are done. And it's not until really around the time the Sherman Act is passed, which is 1890, that the idea that anybody who wants to can just go to the state secretary of state, file uh, for this very interesting business form for any lawful purpose, unspecified, uh, comes along. You, you can't do that. You have to say what you're doing. And remember that a corporation is mostly useful 
because it allows a limited liability form of doing business. You get a benefit from the state. If five people form a corporation, then they are liable only for whatever contribution they put into that corporation, the value of their stock. Their personal assets are not at stake. So it's a privilege from the state. It's one of many, many forms of doing business in today's world. You can have a you know, closely held corporation like the ones in the two companies in the Hobby Lobby case. You can have a corporation like Boeing or General Motors that has a very widely dispersed stock ownership. You can have a partnership. You can be a sole proprietorship. So one of the big issues is what are we going to do with these legal constructs? Are they the same as people? And are we going to look through the corporate form to the owners when we decide what legal obligations they have? In general, the law absolutely prohibits ones looking from the corporation back to the owners for all kinds of reasons. There's a whole doctrine called piercing the corporate veil that tells you when you can do it. So my first concern about the Hobby Lobby case is where are we going with this corporate form? And it is certainly true that the majority of the Supreme Court asked the question, are there alternatives for the employees of Hobby Lobby who want to have access to these various forms of contraceptive services? And the court notes in that case that there are alternatives. And as Judge Jordan points out, a lot of people had been exempted, and they perhaps could go to the insurance companies. It's not 100% clear right at this moment uh, whether those alternatives can be compelled, because the court issued a decision a few weeks later uh, that maybe made it look like they weren't as solid as, as they were. But I would turn the question around. What are the alternatives for a, a deeply religious person who does not want to have their corporation have to comply with this general rule? Well, there's a very easy alternative. You don't have to be a corporation. Uh, because at that point, if it's just you know the ABC partnership, it's the individual people, they certainly have religious rights. And I would be the first to defend their religious rights. But the corporation isn't really the same thing. And I worry in the wake of Hobby Lobby about, for example, uh, a small corporation, which is, let's say, a group of, of you know, a family of devout Muslims. And it's their belief that women should not be in the workplace, that women have a certain role in life. And that's, we all know, you know, that is the belief of some of them. And so they say, you know, we should not be compelled to follow Title VII, which requires us to hire in a non-discriminatory way based on gender. Uh, or maybe we don't have to hire infidels or whatever. So we shouldn't have to hire people of a religion, which is different from ours. I find that a very tough case. And I wish that the Supreme Court more often, whether it's the town of Greece case with the legislative prayer or the prayer at the beginning of a public event or the Hobby Lobby case, used counterfactuals. And they just said, how would this case feel to us if the prayers at the beginning of the legislative sessions were identifiably um, Muslim or identifiably something else, you know, Hindu or, or something, um, w would it feel the same way? And I think that sheds light on what you're really asking people to do that's very useful for us as judges to have. Well, there's a couple threads here, so let me, let me separate them a little bit. So I, I gather from what you said that if, if you hadn't had the corporate form issue, that you might have felt OK about the Hobby Lobby. That's, that's yeah. correct, because I believe that pe the people, like real living beings, mm -hmm. such as the folks in this room, definitely have religious views. Those views are protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. They're not asking for any favor from the state. Mm -hmm. They are taking you know, the ability to run their business, to associate with people, to pay for what they want to pay for. I totally agree that being compelled to pay for somebody else's religion is right at the heart of what Madison was worried about when he opposed the general assessment and writes the memorial and remonstrance. All of those things I have no problem with. So, so where you get 
where you part ways with Judge Jordan is, is really around the corporate The issue. corporate form. But let's, let's extend this just a little bit. If you take mm -hmm. the corporate form out of it, and now you're talking about the examples you gave, where you have, uh, say, someone, and this actually reflects a question we got for the previous group that we didn't get to. So there were some cases in the state courts around the country where a photographer who didn't uh, believe in same-sex marriage was sued for not uh, taking the photographs or for charging a higher rate for the photographs. And there even have been uh, judges around the country who, since these recent uh, decisions have come down, have said, well, I can't, this violates my religious beliefs, I'm not going to perform the marriage. Um, so what about that? <clears throat> can, we t can we take anything from Madison there? And this really goes to the question I think both of you have talked about, is how compelling is, this, is the interest of the government versus the, the, the religious rights of the individuals? Right, well, of course, the law in some ways already accommodates that because if you are below a certain size as a company, you are mm -hmm. not under Title right. VII of the Federal Civil Rights, you're not under the Federal mm -hmm. Civil Rights Act. There's a 15 employee uh, limit. So it understands that if you're you know, a little guy, you're a photographer, you can serve the weddings you want to serve. Maybe you don't do bar mitzvahs, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's up to you. Once you get bigger, there is a point where the public accommodations idea, the, the duty to serve the public comes in. And certainly once you have state action, uh, then the duty to serve others. You can't have a firefighter who says, you know, I've decided not to go put out a fire at an abortion clinic. You know, if you're a firefighter, you just have to put the fires out wherever they may be, mm -hmm. and you don't have that privilege. But that's because there's state action, and I'm uh, certainly prepared to say that the First Amendment so it's the size of the, of the entity, if you will, or the fact. On the private yeah. action side, mm -hmm. it's the size of the entity. Now, some states have laws that go further, but that's a, that's a different matter. Right. Well, it's, it's not too much of a different matter. It's certainly a different matter from Title VII, but the principle of government encroachment on religion is the same. So mm -hmm. if, you're a, if you're a photographer in a little town someplace in California <laughs> and you're told, you won't have a, we will not renew your business license. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, you're going out of business if you won't do this. Well, California that, actually has a civil rights act that covers individual action. So, right. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, this is uh, this is an issue that isn't going to go away because mm -hmm. you got less than 50 mm -hmm. uh, employees. But I, uh, I of course uh, take issue with the idea that that the corporate form is the determinative mm -hmm. point here. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I think it's, it's evident in the dissent in Hobby Lobby and Conestoga that, that it really isn't the corporate form that's the troubling part here because, of course, nobody suggests that uh, uh, corporations which are formed for religious purposes are problematic. Everybody had agreed that that's okay. And, and religious corporations have been around forever. The very first Supreme Court case uh, on religious liberty issues associated with corporations and I think, you know, for, uh, very early 1800s, maybe late 1700s, asked the question, does the corporate form deprive you of the benefits of the First Amendment uh, and freedom of religion? And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. So the corporate form can't be the problem. The issue is, well, we're bothered because it's a for-profit business. Mm -hmm. It's not the corporate piece of it, it's the corporate, it's a fact that you're a corporation that makes money. But, uh, you know, the, the recognition that people make money in all kinds of business forms, that too shows, well, that, that can't be the basis for denying these rights. Mm -hmm. Somehow, and there's lots of Supreme Court case law that says that. So there's Supreme Court case law that says being a corporation doesn't deprive you of First Amendment religious rights. And there's Supreme Court case law that says being a profit-making enterprise doesn't deprive you of religious rights. And yet somehow when you put these two negatives together, mm -hmm. some people say, well, that amounts to a positive right in the government to say, you, you, you've got no religious right. Mm -hmm. That's math that doesn't add up for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the reality is we have a responsibility to make, to make judgments uh, when we have different kinds of religious interests that are put forward. The, uh, the hypothetical post by Judge Wood, 
is a good one, and there are hard cases. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there are hard cases doesn't justify a rule, in my mind, that says, and therefore all profit-making corporations yeah. have no religious well, but, but Jeremy, here, here's mm -hmm. the thing. Um, the corporations that Judge Jordan is talking about, formed for a religious purpose, are corporations that those who have chosen to support them, the shareholders, so to speak, have decided to support that religious purpose. One thing I'd like to note is that you know these multi-purpose corporations, any lawful purpose, which is the usual corporate charter now, uh, don't give the shareholders that choice. Certainly, if it's a if it's a public corporation, not one of these closely held ones. Contrast unions. Uh, there's a real um, analogy drawn in the Citizens United case between corporations and unions. But if you're in a union and you don't agree with the political message that that union is advocating, you have a right not to have your money support that. You have a right to have only a fair share uh, uh, dues imposed against you for whatever the collective bargaining agreement, you know, the, the wage things, the things that you're benefiting from the union. And you have a right to opt out of the political message or if the union is pushing a religious message or whatever it's doing, messages that you don't agree with. There is no correlative right for the shareholders of a large corporation. So I don't think we can just well, talk about corporations. Mm -hmm. but we're, I, w I would be certainly ready to recognize, and in fact, yeah. in the dissent that I wrote, I made a point of saying, we're talking here about a close corporation. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a family-held business, four people, and, and publicly held corporations, that's a discussion for another day. And it is. When you get widely dispersed, diffused ownership, it's a lot more problematic to talk about that. Although I would say the, the comparison to the union is striking because there are many places where if you want a job, you've got to be in the union. But There's you have no to correlation to yeah. that in the stockholder world. If you don't want to <laughs> invest in General Motors, you don't have to invest in General Motors, period. That's no, no doubt That's about different. that, although the person who invests in General Motors might want to help the American car industry and not have the views about yeah. you know, political matters so as a tag. So I want to, I want to assert a moderator's privilege here and yeah. bring us back to James Madison. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, that guy. You no, know, yeah. that guy. But you know, I mean, this is, this is really important stuff, and I think it's, 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 it's great that we're talking about it. But, uh, the, be, before we move on to a couple other things, I mean, the, it seems to me that the, the one thread that does run in here is that neither of you, and, and it sounds like neither of you think that Madison was, was arguing for an absolute religious privilege or an absolute right of government to put itself above religion, and that the, the devil's in the details here, if I can use a phrase that may not be a very religious phrase. I mean, that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that it really is, where, where do you do the act of line drawing and sure. say well, your, your, your assertion of religious principles is, is confounding another interest of the government, which is legitimate? Well, remember, Ma Madison liked yeah. the render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, yeah. render unto God that which is God's. And I think he, and if you read the memorial or anything else, he did believe that both religion and the state would be stronger, each one, if they kept out of each other's hair. Probably from his background, he was more concerned about financial support for religion than he was about some of the free exercise issues that we've come to have to focus on. But, um, I, you know, I, I, because the, the, the issue of the day was established religions. Remember, it's not until, you know, way later uh, well into the 19th century that Massachusetts finally gives up its established church. So establishment was, was more of an issue for him, I think, than, than free exercise, and he works through that as time goes on. Anything you want to add? Uh, no, I'm, I actually agree completely with you. <laughs> <laughs> See, it can happen. It's an important moment here. Um, so let's, let's, we'll just spend one more minute on, on religion. Um, if we can, and that's uh, the, the town of Greece case. So, so again, the same things we've been talking about, the, the free exercise and, and establishment clauses apparently in some type of, of conflict, and then you have this additional historical uh, uh, trope from the Supreme Court about that, that a lot of these kinds of things, like legislative prayers, have been viewed as symbolic rather than 
substantively religious. Uh, any comment either of you has on that? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the camp that uh, caused Professor Newborn here to shake his head earlier and say, I just can't understand how they would, how they could uh, uh, say it's no big deal for people to relax. Look, I'm one of, I'm one of the folks who thinks people ought to be able to uh, relax uh, as adults in a large, you know, in a room where uh, somebody bows their head and says, and I hope we do a good job, right? I mean, that's a historical feature of American uh, political life. And, and it's not just sort of an opiate of the masses thing, the way a lot of people want to, you know, describe religion. There's a, there's a, something that Madison would surely have recognized, which is that some acknowledgement of uh, a higher power is a, an appropriately humbling thing for people who exercise political power to have in mind, that they hold power in trust, and ultimately they have, they, they're perhaps gonna be answerable to somebody higher than they are. That's, that's a tradition which was very much a part of his experience. And I think he would have been shocked at the notion that 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 experience which formed the foundation for his thinking on free exercise, right of conscience, and uh, 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 rule against establishment, somehow, uh, even as society grows, grows more pluralistic, could not be something people could manage to well, well, let, me, let me push you on that just a little bit because Professor uh, Newborn brought up the, the writings that Madison uh, wrote later where he said that he regretted his vote yeah. in favor of the chaplain. And, and I know from my own reading about Madison, he was, he was actually a quite religious person. He took religion very seriously, yeah. but he felt that it was something that should be private and that, that bringing it into the public sphere uh, cheapened it in some way. And he, he said things like that. Um, so. What, what, what do you think? I mean, is, did, he, he, apparently there is some historical record that he did not approve ultimately at the end of his life of, of the idea of legislative prayer. Uh, I, I can't, I, I, have, I haven't read what Professor yeah. Newborn's yeah. read on that, so I can't comment mm -hmm. on that. Uh, what I do think is accurate is that the Supreme Court uh, was on sound footing mm -hmm. in, in making the statement that this is not a practice which crosses uh, the line that was set by the First Amendment, mm -hmm. okay? Now, people, people of perfectly good will can say, I don't think that's an intelligent line, or we should move that line, mm -hmm. but it's not beyond our ability to say that was part of the original understanding. You know, Professor Newborn was saying, originalism, this is where it all falls apart. I don't think originalism uh, does fall apart properly understood. Madison actually, said something, I, I like this so well I wrote it down. Will you let me read it? Okay. You bet. Indulgence yeah. here. He said, all new laws, though penned with the greatest technical skills and passed on the fullest and most mature deliberation, are considered more or less obscure and equivocal until their meaning be liquidated and ascertained by a series of discussions and adjudications. Mm -hmm. I love that word liquidated there. <laughs> uh, and I take him to be saying, and having understood, we've got a constitution we're writing here, but there's a bunch of stuff here that the meaning of which is not gonna be fully understood until it's put to the test, until it goes through the crucible and there's some actual battle about it. And then the meaning of it will be liquidated. It'll be understood in a more complete way. Uh, and if you, if you look at the, the, the um, legislative prayer business, I think you can look at it through that lens and say, historically, that was not viewed as an establishment of religion, and there's no reason to think it is now. It's a very interesting topic. I mean, I have read the documents in which Madison says he had come to regret those particular votes. And I go back to a concept that Justice O'Connor has articulated from time to time in the opinions she wrote 
uh, in this area about the whole, she was, she's just a wonderful person and, and has the way of capturing things in a pragmatic way that I think Madison would have liked. She said, in some ways, it's about being an outsider or an insider. And if you have to go to your local town council or school board or state legislature or whatever, and over and over again, you have to sit through a prayer that comes from somebody else's religious tradition. You're Jewish and you're going and they're constantly invoking, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died to save us from our sins. A perfectly fine thing to say for anybody who's a Christian, and we have mostly a Christian society, but, but it's not exclusively. And you're the Jewish person and you're sitting here listening to that over and over again. In Justice O'Connor's words, it's going to make you feel like an outsider. Uh, and that is not the world that Madison wanted. He wanted a world in which every member of society, he knew Quaker, I mean, Dolly had been a Quaker before she married him. He knew people from other Christian traditions. And as, as you said, Jeremy, you know, he was quite familiar. I don't think an adherent of the deist mm -hmm. tradition, but certainly there were people around at the time. So there's discussion in the writings of the time even about the person who is of no religious faith at all. They just don't see the world in that way. So they don't actually think that there's some higher power evaluating what they're doing. So you get down to the question, well, what do we want? Do we want toleration or do we want real disengagement of government in the business of religion? And in Madison's very early career, he gets the word toleration out of a Virginia resolution and substitutes the concept of freedom of conscience. So even though it may not seem like the end of the world, I don't really think it is the end of the world, but I do think it's an important moment. And as a, as a child who went to a public school in Texas where we had over the loudspeakers, a 4,000 person school, over the loudspeaker every morning, a prayer that began with our Lord Jesus Christ, this and that, mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I come from a Christian tradition, it wasn't something that was, you know, that I had never heard. I heard it every Sunday morning. But still, in a public setting, I think Madison wanted everyone to feel included. He didn't want the people who Justice O'Connor described as the outsiders to feel not included. And I think he would have stuck with his mm -hmm. later thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he might have, might have disagreed with the majority. In with the of town Greece. of Greece yeah. majority, mm -hmm. I think so. Okay, well, let's, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about um, free speech, because that's uh, obviously another topic that's been quite on the minds of, of judges uh, in, in the last few years. And, and without getting into what is a corporation and how are corporations different from unions, what, what, um, what do we make of, of McCutcheon and, and, uh, and Citizens United from the perspective of, of history? Right, I mean, I... Entirely putting the question of corporations to one side. Now let's say speech is money. Um, and the thing that bothers me about that, if I try to channel you know, Madison or Jefferson, and I'm probably no better a channeler than anybody, um, is the disparity between that idea of democracy, where the rich people have a very loud voice and the poor people don't have a very loud voice, they have a little tiny voice. Um, they, Jefferson and Madison were so concerned about a broader concept of democracy, and they were pushing against you know, a, a much different theory that the Federalist Party, as it came to be, uh, had. Uh, they, they wanted to expand the franchise, they wanted everybody, they had this idea of citizen, you know, independent farmer citizens uh, running the country. And I think they would have been bothered at the notion uh, that, that speech was so unequal uh, in our political structure. And in that sense, I'm not even sure that they would have gone along with the commercial speech idea, but I'm putting that to one side because we're talking about core political mm -hmm. speech here, people who can put ads on, on TV 24 hours a day I keep wondering when the laws of economics are going to kick in and the law of diminishing marginal returns is going to uh, be, be verified. Maybe it's already happened uh, here in Pennsylvania, I don't know. Um, 
but but I think he would have been very disturbed at the direction things have taken. So he, he was pushing back against the Federalists who were, they were elitists. They, yeah, they, only they, the elites should. You had to own property, you had to right. have this, that, or the other education. Uh, he was pushing back, and, and, and both Madison and Jefferson wanted ordinary folks to right. be making the democratic decisions. That's well, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not sure that's true at all. Well, I, think, oh, I, yeah. I think James Madison was uh, every inch the elitist. Mm -hmm. He was a product of a plantation society. Mm -hmm. He was the favored oldest son and scion of uh, the most powerful family in Orange County. Uh, or, uh, and he was, um, he was a very, very a uh, big proponent of the idea that we should have a Republican form of government, in yeah. part because we should have our lawmakers selected from that class of people who are well-educated and thoughtful, et cetera. So, you know, he's not the everyman, and I don't think he thought of himself as the everyman. Um, uh, now, we, have, we get a real discomfort in our society today with uh, elitism, but I think the reality is those founders were elitists. That's the, they were the product of their uh, generation. Having said that, uh, uh, I think Madison's own words indicate that he did want people, for there to be robust public debate, and he thought that we don't assist in that process by uh, letting government make some judgments about who gets to talk and how much they get to talk. Uh, that the disease is worse, the cure is worse than the, the disease if you put the government in the role of doctoring how much speech and from whom you can get. So Congress shall make no law is pretty definitive language. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, whether you think that's poetic language or not, I think it's it's relatively clear. It's, I'm not a, uh, an absolutist on the First Amendment the way Justice Black was, for example, but I think that that's strong language and he, and he selected it for a reason. Um, so I don't think he would be comfortable with something, you know, with the web of reg regulations that the Federal Election Commission might come up with as being consistent with make no law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even, even trying to um, uh, deal with I mean, some of the arguments that were advanced for that legislation were, were fighting corruption and you know, preventing undue influence of, over legislators and so forth, those wouldn't be uh, sufficient? Or, or how, how, do you, how do you reconcile well, those? Well, yeah, that's, that's the battle that has existed and is going to continue mm -hmm. to exist is how much do you let the government, in the name of preventing corruption and undue influence, get into the business of saying, and now you have to stop speaking, mm -hmm. right? That's the, that is the fight. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, I don't have the quotation at, uh, at my fingertips the way I wish I did, but there, real, there, there are points at which Madison is explicit in saying, uh, in effect, uh, if you, if you start trying to regulate the speech, you're gonna get into worse trouble than if you just let it rip. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, you know, uh, we're, how much we project ourselves onto Madison, I go back to what I said at the start. You know, he says things that we like and we tend to remember them. Mm -hmm. we, he says mm -hmm. other things and we tend, they tend to slip from our, our memory. Um, but. I, but he was a very much a proponent of free speech, and I think he would have been troubled by the notion that there's a government body that tells you when you have to stop getting your message out because you've spent too much money. But it's, but it's free speech he's a proponent of, and um, I think it's a mistake to assume too readily that dollars are speech. Uh, nothing prevents anyone, nothing should prevent anyone from speaking as much as they want. Run articles in the newspaper, write op-eds, do whatever you want. But I think the corruption angle that Jeremy mentions is something that was not in front of him. Giving huge amounts of money 
um, as the owner of company X because you now want the legislator to take your phone calls first and to pass your legislation, mm -hmm. I just think is a problem beyond what he was confronting. Really? Because his buddy Jefferson, in effect, with Madison's help, set up their friend in business with the press here in Philadelphia. Oh, they and did I think that. that was, that was directly to forward and, and uh, improve their political position. And it was done secretly. Mm -hmm. And it was done in a way that was uh, undermining the government at the time when Jefferson was the vice president. Mm -hmm. So I don't think But there was another paper already. <laughs> these, <laughs> there was another paper things, already in business. Yeah, but, but precisely, that's exactly the point. There were other voices. Yeah. The, the interesting, yeah, I, th I think I mean, it's the, quite different. It's, it's interesting that in the, in the McCutcheon versus FEC case, the, the court actually tried to engage with this and say, well, what is, what is corruption? And when, does, right. when do you start to uh, uh, diminish and destroy the political process that this is all about? And, and I think the fairly read, the majority view is that, well, obviously you can't pay uh, office holders to do things. I mean, that that's direct corruption. But then they're, they're sort of trying to draw the distinction between that and... Well, they are, real, but yeah. Madison yeah. would have been very disturbed, yeah. I yeah. think, at the thought that many people have been silenced because of the way the political system mm -hmm. operates silenced? today. Who's silenced? Anyone who doesn't have enough money to buy ads on TV. That, well, I don't think they're silenced for what you just said. They can keep speaking. But you've put your finger on an important point, which is should the public airwaves be treated as a public good and not just be auctioned off, mm -hmm. that's another issue and one that you can have a very significant and I think serious conversation about whether we've handled that correctly. But I don't think anybody has been silenced. The question is how, how big a megaphone are we comfortable with other people having? And, and that's where I think Madison probably would have, would have recognized that, you know, uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to let the megaphones shout and hope people can sort it out, rather than having people try to say how much you can. How speak big of a about. megaphone you get, but right. but but let's just push this one more step because uh, the the last thing I wanted to talk about was was federalism and, and limited government, which were things that were very important to Madison in his day. I mean, what if the what if the government were to say, all right, we're going to have like they do in Canada, a number of other uh, Western democracies, we're going to have um, uh, public, uh, publicly funded, publicly uh, available use of the airwaves for uh, for campaigns, and the government were to make that. Uh, do do you think, under the the limited government theory, and again we're just trying to talk about Madison, not whether this is good public policy or not, would that be consistent with with his his framework? Given, I, given what we're dealing I, with, I think it, I think it would be, but, but that's because I have a, a view of the of the radio spectrum as a as a commons, mm -hmm. right? I'm not I'm not entirely comfortable with the way we've treated it, which mm -hmm. is now you own it and you get to sell the rights to use it, mm -hmm. and the public can only get access mm -hmm. to it by buying into it. I'm not sure that I'm wholly comfortable with the way we've. Uh, We've managed that. So, if you the, think about it as a commons, as we understood commons in the late 18th century, the idea is that everybody has access to it. Yeah, right? people, you, you get a, you know, going back to merry old England, there's there, there's the corner in Hyde, Hyde Park, Park where yeah. you could stand up and Speaker's shout, right? Yeah. And 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 <laughs> still the there. modern still equivalent there. is yeah. there, yeah. and the the modern yeah. equivalent yeah. of that is is for better or worse, it's television and radio and increasingly, of course, the internet, which may undermine a lot of the concerns we're having today because my, my kids' generation, you know, I, I don't know how much of those ads they're seeing. Well, you're, you're, you're probably on YouTube right now. That's not how they absorb their this, media. This, this session's probably... Yeah. Yeah. That's a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts, Dan? I mean, is this, is this something that, that could be... Um, Done? I think it would be constitutional to do mm -hmm. it, if mm -hmm. that's the first question. I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything in either Madison's vision of the Constitution or the current vision of the Constitution that would prevent Congress from passing a law that says we've decided to rethink the way that the public uh, airwaves. Now, of course, we have a very interesting debate going on right now about the Internet, net neutrality uh, discussion that is going to 
um, have an influence on whether that will turn out to be a corrective mechanism or whether it will turn out to be just as bad as everything else that we have. But my concern is that the way the Supreme Court has gone with McCutcheon, with other cases, um, has made it potentially more difficult for us to take those corrective measures. What we have right now is the situation where one individual with a whole lot of money, no matter where they are in the political spectrum, there are people like that here and there, um, can, in a sense, preempt the debate, and there's just not any room left. And maybe what Judge Jordan says is a way to begin correcting that, which would be great. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you both in the, in the little bit of time we have left. So you've both been federal judges for, for a long time. You both have really wrestled with constitutional issues for a long time. What, what, is, what is one takeaway or one image from, from your study of Madison, both in the past and in preparation for, for this program, that, that will be in your mind going forward. That's something that you'll, you'll think about. Boy. Um, well, I think I will, I hope I will keep in mind uh, the image of a not physically imposing person, mm -hmm. a not uh, a charismatic personality um, managing to persuade by the force and power of ideas. Uh, here's, he's, a, he's a kind of a monument to the capacity of careful reasoning and well-articulated thought to bring uh, people with diverse ideas together, at, uh, finding some agreement. That's a, that's a real heartening thing, particularly speaking of television in an age where you think, you know, uh, it's only people who have access to TV or who are telegenic or who, you know, query whether a guy like Madison would, could get elected dog catcher today. I don't know. But, but you'd like to think, I'd like to think that Madison's uh, big gift to us is uh, that, that we, are, we are able to sit down, learn from history, think deeply about problems, and come up with solutions, including structural solutions that can guide and assist and preserve freedoms going forward. Mm -hmm. So really, it's what everybody's talked about in one way or another, the combination of being, being a big thinker and having a big intellect, but, but really looking at how things play out in, in the world. Yeah, and we haven't even talked about, because yeah. we just really haven't had time, the this, this structural stuff, mm -hmm. the genius of the Constitution, really is the structure of the Constitution. Uh, and he did make it hard on purpose. They made it hard on purpose, and and I'm one of those people who doesn't say, "Oh, that's a problem." I say, "Very prescient, well done." It's a good good thing that government yes. isn't more yeah. efficient than it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? So I take away from Madison um, the lesson of the importance of. I can call it this lifetime learning, uh, keeping one's mind open as experience accumulates, as new problems come along, and you realize that what you thought had been a relatively straightforward solution actually needs to be more nuanced, or what you thought was a nuanced solution actually turns out to just need a, a very clear, simple rule. So this is a man who, you know, as I said, goes through stages of thinking we really needed a strong federal government. Then he realizes that maybe there need to be some breaks on the system and take, take the issue of the Bank of the United States. When he's in the first Congress in the House of Representatives, he's violently opposed to Alexander Hamilton's whole idea for the way the debt's going to be restructured and the economy's going to be set up. He opposes the first bank of the United States. Then we fast forward to his own presidency, and by that time, he's seen a lot more. He's learned a lot more, and he signs the bill, putting the second bank of the United States. Right across the street from here. Right yeah. here, <laughs> in, into effect. Yeah. But, but he's learned, and it's not that he had swept it under the rug. He had been very out front in his opposition to the first bank, but he learns. He rethinks the chaplaincy issue. He rethinks so many things. He and Jefferson together, again, with this limited powers idea, when confronted, you know, Madison's Secretary of State, Jefferson's president, 
with the possibility of the Louisiana Purchase, take a great deep breath and they say, this is just so awesome. We need to be able to do that. There isn't any enumerated power in Article 1, Section 8. There isn't anything in Article 2 that says that, but they realize somehow that the treaty-making power, the way to run the country, requires this kind of flexibility. So, and, and yet this is not a man who ever compromises his fundamental integrity. He is thinking out loud. He's putting his ideas to the test of debate and to the test of others for whom he has tremendous respect. And in my opinion, it's a model uh, that we can all aspire to, although I don't know how many of us will achieve it. So uh, you can see, I think, why uh, Chief Judge Wood and Judge Jordan are, are both so widely respected, uh, even though they don't agree about a lot of things. And they, like, they, they are both, we both like you. Yeah, well, that's good. That's right. I'm glad. I'm glad Unanimous I'm, vote there. I'm glad, I'm glad that you can agree about that. But I, I want to thank them for, for making the, their time available and, and doing uh, their very characteristic, conscientious job of, of thinking about uh, our topics today. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, and being part of our conversation. Um, so uh, we, are, we are done. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>